Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Nora Volkow will present Addiction as a Brain Disease, What Does It Mean? The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $328 million and is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in the grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, chemical dependency, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Nora Volkow. Dr. Volkow is director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Volkow's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. As a research psychiatrist and scientist, Dr. Volkow pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic effects and addictive properties of abusable drugs. Her studies have documented changes in the dopamine system affecting, among, among others, the functions of frontal brain regions involved with motivation, drive, and pleasure in addiction. She has also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging. Dr. Volkow has published more than 580 peer-reviewed articles and written more than 90 book chapters and non-peer-reviewed manuscripts and has, ed and has edited three books on neuroimaging for mental and addictive disorders. Dr. Volkow is a member of the Foundation's Scientific Council. The Council identifies the most promising research ideas to fund with Foundation grants each year. Today's webinar will start with Dr. Volkow's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel of your screen. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Volkow, and she will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to present Dr. Nora Volkow. Nora, the stage is yours. Jeff, how are you? How are you doing? Good, Our good, thank you. Problem, apparently here, something, there was something that happened there, but uh, thanks for having me. I, uh, as soon as we have the slides on, I'll start. Okay. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar, and uh, I am going to address what is it that we now understand of what happens in the brain of a person that has become addicted. And what do we understand by addiction is the state where an individual no longer can control his or her urges to take the drug even though they want to stop. So at the essence of addiction, there is a lack of control over the very intense drives to take the drug that ultimately creates havoc in the person's life. So using imaging technologies, we have uh, started to explore what are the changes in the brain of people that are addicted and how do they differ from those of individuals that do not have a problem with addiction. To start with, we've focused um, from our perspective as, as, as scientists uh, in imaging at Brookhaven National Laboratory on the dopamine system. And, and why have we been interested on the dopamine system? And this is because we now know that all of the drugs of abuse that can produce addiction, all of the drugs that can produce addiction in the human brain have a common effect, and that is they increase dopamine in brain reward regions. And when dopamine is increased by these drugs, they activate the reward regions. And that's exactly why people take them, because you will be creating this sense of well-being associated with the activation of these 
important centers in the function of our brain. And the reward centers are actually uh, closely linked with our motivation to do things. Uh, in general, things that are rewarding or pleasurable, we're much more likely to engage our interest and our drive to do them than things that are not pleasurable. And in fact, things that are unpleasurable or displeasurable or aversive will motivate our actions in the opposite direction to avoid them. And dopamine is instrumental in regulating the systems that motivate behaviors. And so you have here slides uh, which were taken in studies done in animals in which the investigators are measuring dopamine concentration in the reward region marked there as the nucleus accumbens. And you can see that uh, this effect, in fact, that you see this very large increase with amphetamine is much smaller with food. But this is the way it uh, was intended to be. Food is intended to increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and motivate your action to eat it. And drugs hijack that system. And they hijack it in much more potent ways than any natural reinforcers. And so it is now accepted that these really uh, much more efficient activation of the dopamine system by drugs is what triggers uh, the neuroplastic changes that ultimately will result in addiction in those individuals that are vulnerable. And why do I say this? I say this because not everybody that gets exposed to a drug will become addicted. Just like not everybody that smokes cigarettes will end up having lung cancer. So we now know that in, in the, as is the case for many medical diseases, genetics play a very important role. And so there are individuals that because of their genetics or also because of their uh, developmental stage, children and adolescents are more vulnerable, have higher risk of becoming addicted than others. But all of the drugs of abuse that we now know can trigger these neuroplastic changes. And in those that are vulnerable, this will lead to addiction. And that is the lack of control over drug intake. So using uh, imaging technologies, um, we have uh, investigated specifically what happens to the dopamine system in people that are addicted. Right? Because if all of the drugs of abuse are, are uh, acting through this dopaminergic system, then it follows that uh, this may be one that is affected by the repeated administration of drugs. And to start with, we were uh, wanted to ask the question of if in humans, just as it has been shown in animals, you could also document the importance of drugs increasing dopamine in reward centers vis-a-vis -vis the subjective experience of well-being and that drugs produce when someone is intoxicated. So using an imaging technology referred to by positron emission tomography and a radioactive compound that binds to a dopamine receptor. Now dopamine is increased by drugs, but for it to have an effect, it has to bind to receptors. And these receptors then activate uh, the system. So we can use uh, this imaging technique to measure the number of receptors, uh, dopamine receptors, that are available in any one of us for dopamine to bind to us and produce an effect. So under normal conditions, you can see this is an image where the dopamine receptors are located. These are dopamine D2 receptors, by the way. And uh, when uh, someone is given no drug, so you see very high concentration because there's no drug, so you have those receptors available. However, when you give a drug, in this case, the drug that we have given, it's a drug whose action is very similar to that of cocaine. It, it binds to a protein that we call a transporter, whose main function is to, when dopamine is released, recycle it back, and in that process terminate its action. So cocaine and methylphenidate block this transporter, dopamine increases, 
it occupies these receptors, and you can see that when you give your radioactive compound, it can no longer bind here because dopamine has been increased by the drug, and the binding of the radioactive compound goes down. And using this methodology, we have shown something fascinating, which is just like in animals, the higher the increases in dopamine produced by the drugs, the more intense the high. And this has actually been corroborated by for multiple drugs, not just intravenous methylphenidate, as shown here, intravenous amphetamine, nicotine, alcohol. In humans, the higher the increases of dopamine are in these regions, uh, the more intense the high. What was interesting and actually unexpected was that when we gave exactly the same drug, methylphenidate, but instead of giving it intravenously, we gave it orally, we found that it, the drug increased dopamine, but we didn't see a high. And this was very intriguing because it raised the question that if we want to understand reward or the high or the euphoria, just as increases in dopamine, then this finding could be, could not be explained. Now, there is a difference between the way that uh, intravenous methylphenidate is increasing dopamine, we are injecting, and then one minute later, we're measuring the changes in dopamine. Whereas when you do it orally, you're giving it one hour before, because it takes a long, long time for the drug to get inside the brain. And this was something that was relevant because it has been known for studies in animals that the speed at which you administer a drug determines how rewarding it is. If you inject a drug very, very fast, it's much more rewarding than if you inject it slowly. And if you inject a drug, it's much more rewarding than if you take it orally. So the speed at which the drug enters the brain had been known to be important in determining its rewarding effect. And so here we have, effectively, when you give, this is the, the time that the, the cow fast, the, the methylphenidate itself, can go into the brain and we can measure it again with imaging technologies, directly measure how rapidly the intravenous methylphenidate gets into the brain and you can see it gets very fast. And then it starts to go down slowly. When you give it orally, you can see that it takes a long, long time to peak, 60 to, to, to uh, 120 minutes. So this, this difference in the, what we call the, the rate of uptake of the drug in brain, and the, which will reflect in this producing very fast increases in dopamine versus this producing very slow increases in dopamine, is fundamental in uh, determining the rewarding effect of a drug. But it also was a fundamental finding because it leads us to understand why is that so? Why is it indeed that a drug like a methylphenidate, which we use for the treatment of ADHD, can be very safe uh, when given orally, but when you inject it, can be actually quite addictive. Um, not as addictive as cocaine, because cocaine actually can go into the brain even faster than methylphenidate, but it can be addictive. And that, at the essence, is the fact that by changing the route of administration, we can deliver the drug very rapidly, turning it into addictive compounds that otherwise could be safe to use therapeutically. But also highlighting an, uh, an aspect that we didn't know about drugs of abuse, that it's not just that they are increasing dopamine in the brain that makes them rewarding, but that they are increasing it very, very rapidly. And again, this was important in our understanding about why drugs are rewarding. Because normally in our brains, the dopamine cells are there to motivate our actions, either to act when something is pleasurable or rewarding, or to avoid when something is aversive. And the way that the signals of, of, of the, the dopamine cell signal is not just by the amount of dopamine that is being released, or how fast it's been released in such a way that when something 
requires our immediate attention, something that is very significant, the dopamine cells fire very, very rapidly. And that signals the importance of that particular event. And that uh, something that is rewarding is something that will drive our attention. Whereas when things are stable, there's not the reward that we expect, then the dopamine cells fire much slower. And that keeps us alerted, keeps us um, prepared for our response, but it's not driving our attention to any specific stimuli. And now it is known that this very fast uh, frequency of firing is exactly what drugs are doing. They are producing reward because they are emulating this, what we call, basic, fast firing of dopamine cells that in the brain is the way that you signal saliency and it drives your motivation. And there's also something really remarkable when these dopamine cells firing so fast, the dopamine uh, cell signaling goes phasic. That triggers a memory. Just that, that, that facilitates the learning of that association. So when you are in a situation where dopamine cells fire, basically that will increase the likelihood that the memory will be formed in emotional centers of the brain. A memory process that to differentiate it from the memory that we use in order to recall what we ate or what we wore yesterday or what we did uh, is associated with emotion. That from those that is associated with more cognitive operations as sequential events that are not per se emotionally mediated, we call it conditioning. So the, the memory triggered by basic dopamine cell firing, which is an emotional memory, is called conditioning. And that in and of itself is, uh, has been studied extensively by researchers and, and involves the strengthening of connections. This memory involves strengthening of connections between neurons in such a way that uh, that particular stimuli will, in the future, elicit a much stronger response. This, this for us in the general field of addiction gives us an opportunity to develop uh, medications that uh, hopefully one day may be able to counteract the strengthening of these memory processes that will are responsible for driving a lot of the abnormal behavior that we see in individuals that are addicted. Now, one of the first questions that we wanted to ask was since we had shown with imaging and others had shown also that the ability of drugs to increase dopamine was involved with rewarding effects, just like it had been shown in animals. And as a result of that, people were just saying, well, an hypothesis that, that was uh, believed to be true for many years was that people that were addicted to drugs um, were addicted to drugs because in them, the drugs were able to produce much larger increases in dopamine and therefore much greater activation of these reward centers. And of course, it made theoretical sense. So if you are more sensitive and in view that drugs activate the system, then therefore you're more likely to seek these drugs and therefore more likely to eventually become addicted. So we did a series of studies to try to investigate if this hypothesis was correct. And to our utmost surprise, we found that it was not correct. In fact, we found that it was opposite. Not only did, in this case, studies with cocaine abusers, so we found the same thing with alcoholics. Not only did cocaine abusers not show an enhanced increase in dopamine, they actually showed a very blunted response. So we, here we have a normal control with a placebo which we use to control for placebo effects, which are important. And this is the intravenous methylphenidate, which, by the way, normal controls or cocaine abusers reported as being very rewarding, and cocaine abusers, in fact, reported to be similar to intravenous cocaine. And you can see the, very, the large difference between this and this. Now, look at these cocaine abusers. You visually don't see any difference between this and this. And when you actually go ahead and do the measurement, the actual measurement, you can see that the change between this and this is basically half in the cocaine abusers 
what you observe in control. And this is in, indicates that this is a very profound reduction in the ability of intravenous methylphenidate to produce a high. Interestingly, again, contrary to what everybody was reporting, the subjective report of what the drugs make the individuals feel, the high, which is one of the indicators of reward, was also significantly reduced in cocaine abusers. They did experience a high, but it was attenuated when compared to control. So in this study, which was the first that we reported in 1997, we were surprised by the fact that we could not corroborate the hypothesis believed to be true and that uh, used to explain why people that were addicted were taking the drug. Now, one of the particular issues on this study was um, that we were doing uh, studies, we were measuring the changes in dopamine. When patients were in a hospital, so they had been withdrawn at least six weeks from cocaine. So a compound that we needed to address was the extent to which these reflected withdrawal, just the fact that you were withdrawing. And a very valid question was, well, what happens when someone is actively taking the drug, which is really when you see the loss of control. So re we replicated this study in active cocaine abusers, that is, individuals that were consuming cocaine, and we brought them to the laboratory to try to see, to see if in them one of, we could see this accentuated, this enhanced response of dopamine to the drug. And this is what we found. This is the, the, the control subjects. And now you see average for all of these control subjects. We're averaging their images on placebo. And this is with methylphenidate. And you see exactly the same, the decrease in the binding that reflects that dopamine has been enhanced as we have seen before. And just as we have seen before, these are active cocaine abusers. This is the average for the placebo, the average for the methylphenidate. You visually see no effect. And when you quantify, you actually see that in this cohort of active cocaine abusers, the effects are even less than 30% what you see in actually less than 20%, basically almost 20% what you see in control profoundly attenuated, indicating that what we had observed in the past of an attenuation of the ability of that drug to increase dopamine in cocaine abusers was not a factor of withdrawal because we were observing it in patients that were actively taking the drug. However, a question that then emerged was, well, you know, these are studies that are being done on individuals in the laboratory setting, but when people take drugs, they take it in an environment where they are surrounded by cues and that those cues themselves drive them to want to take the drug. So we repeated this experiment in active cocaine, a different group of active cocaine abusers, but we tested them with, with presentations of cues or without presentation of cues. And I'm showing the data presented in a different type of analysis that indicates on different planes of the brain where dopamine has been increased by methylphenidate. And these are the control subjects, different planes, and in colors you can see all of the areas where intravenous methylphenidate increases dopamine. And you can see it throughout the whole striatal, as well as some of the cortical areas on the prefrontal cortex, and I'll be bringing that up later. Now look at these cocaine abusers, in whom we are actually presenting them with juice, cocaine juice. And the same cocaine abusers, we give them again IV methylphenidate with no cues. It doesn't make a difference. The cues did in no way amplify the effects of methylphenidate. And under both conditions, we saw what we already had seen in the past, a marked, marked attenuation. It's barely visible. So you see some effects here in the nucleus accumbens, but they are tiny, uh, certainly when compared to those of the control. And, and, but they were there. They were actually very, very attenuated, but even though it was attenuated, they were having an effect. And what was very interesting is that, yes, in cocaine abusers as well as alcoholics, 
the response of their brains to the drug, to the consumption of the drug itself is very attenuated. And you see that uh, here, just extracted for the planes where you have the nucleus accumbens. The control, the control here, the cocaine abusers here, showing it here, very tiny. But even though there is this very attenuated response, this very attenuated response, so here is the higher increases in dopamine in this plane or in this side, so the left, less increases in dopamine here, that in the individuals in whom, even though these were attenuated, the drug increased dopamine were the ones that were reporting uh, increased craving, increased desire for cocaine. So even though it's very, very attenuated, that very small response is still sufficient to generate the desire for the drug. And this, of course, is fundamental. Because one of the things that happens when people take a drug like cocaine is that when they are intoxicated, the moment that they take the drug, even if it's a tiny amount, it doesn't matter, a tiny amount, that in and of itself will trigger the desire of wanting more. And even if it's a big amount, they also, that consumption will trigger the wanting more and more and more and more. The insatiable desire to take the drug that's characterizing being um, cocaine intake that can lead a person to consume cocaine for 24 hours nonstop or longer sometimes uh, until there's no more drug or they physically collapse. But this finding was very, very puzzling because if they had a decrease in, decrease in the ability of drugs to, to increase dopamine, why, why bother? Or, and also, if, if, if you actually know that you don't want to take the drug, and that's, again, one of the characteristics of the patients that tell you, you know, I don't want to take the drug. I, I just cannot control it. So we have a situation that is difficult to explain, right? On the one hand, we have... They have less increase in dopamine, but that's sufficient to actually generate that desire. But they, they cannot control it. They cannot control it. So we were wondering, well, what is going on on the control system? Well, we know that the control systems in the brain are actually predominantly uh, regulated by the prefrontal areas of the brain. And we have the, the prefrontal cortex is a very large area of the brain that is involved in several aspects of what we call executive function. And some of these regions, for example, have an element of cognition that enables you to make a decision to make a, do a judgment like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And based on that, then pass that information to other areas of the prefrontal cortex, such as the ventral part here to determine whether based on the value of the, of the stimuli or the behavior, you decide to act or not. Then there are another area, the anterior single leg arrows, that also enables us to analyze a situation and detect if it makes sense or not. And if it doesn't make sense, then pass that message into also inferior areas of the prefrontal cortex and striatum to determine the best mode of action. So, the prefrontal cortex analyzes multiple aspects of the stimuli that's in front of us to make, help us make a decision and carry it through. Interestingly, these prefrontal areas are regulated by the dopamine system. So the dopamine system, the, the proper function of the dopamine system is necessary to regulate the function of the prefrontal cortex. And part of that regulation, that dopaminergic regulation of the prefrontal cortex, is mediated by the striatum. So we were interested in understanding how the repeated administration of drugs, which we already knew is basically, obviously, influencing the changes in dopamine produced by drugs, would they also be influencing the function of the brain when you are not taking drugs? So we also, therefore, investigated individuals not just when they were intoxicated, but also when they were not intoxicated. Because that is the stage where they have the ability, at least theoretically, to say, well, right now, if I make the decision not to take the drug, I'm going to be able to carry through, not take it. And what was very intriguing from the beginning of our studies is whether we studied cocaine abusers, methamphetamine abusers, 
alcoholics, heroin abusers, and even nicotine abusers, tobacco smokers, all of these individuals addicted to this drug had a common characteristic. And that is the levels of receptors, the levels of receptors themselves, not how much dopamine, but the levels of receptors were significantly decreased. Again, um, regardless of the type of addiction that you were looking at. And this was very interesting because when you have something like that, you wonder, well, how does this relate to the process of addiction? And it's important because, in, in a way, the way that you would say is if it's so consistent, could it mean that low levels of dopamine receptors make you vulnerable? And or alternatively, you could say, well, perhaps having high levels protects you. But how do you actually establish that causality? So in this case, what we did was take advantage, guide our findings in humans, in people that were addicted, to actually guide the experiments in animals. So we've been doing experiments where we make on animal models of addiction to cocaine and alcohol. And these are two studies that we've done in animal models of alcohol. I'm not, but the same findings are true for, for cocaine. And we took advantage of these animal models to say, if we can generate an animal model that is addicted to a drug, and we can, in them, increase the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And if that increase in D2 receptors, if that is opposed to what we're seeing in addicted individuals, interferes with co their consumptions of drugs, then we know that low levels of D2 receptors is making them vulnerable. So we did that. And these are two different experiments in the upper part, in the lower part. It's the same strategy. Uh, both of them are genetic therapeutic interventions in animals that have been made addicted to alcohol, except the type of animal is different. This is a streg dolly rat, a generic rat, and this is a, a in, in rats that have been bred because they spontaneously prefer the use of alcohol. So we wanted to see if in these two breeds of rats, ones that are just generic, Increasing D2 receptors, which we can do using a gene therapy approach that delivers that D2 receptor gene into the nucleus accumbens. And when you do that, receptors go up. This is an approach, unfortunately, that's only short lasting. And so by day 10, the levels are back to normal. So these are increases in receptors, they go back to baseline at 10 days. Uh, but you can always, again, inject, but that's a temporal limitation. And at the same time, in these animals, we can measure how that changes alcohol intake. So these are decreases in alcohol intake. And what you can see is that as the receptors go up, the alcohol intake goes dramatically down. So in these animals, increasing levels of dopamine D2 receptors protecting them, protected them against consuming high quantities of alcohol. And we observe exactly the same effect in alcohol-preferring rats, which actually are rats that consume huge quantities of alcohol by themselves. As I say, they've been bred for these characteristics. And even in these animals that have a vulnerability, evidently genetic, for consuming high contents of alcohol, increasing D2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens significantly reduce their alcohol intake indicating, indeed, that having high levels of dopamine D2 receptors appears to protect against the consumption of high quantities of alcohol, as evidenced here in these animals, or these ones here. Um, which, again, is a very interesting phenomenon because it, it helps us identify one single protein, the dopamine D2 receptor, that when you have high levels, it actually seems to protect you against the consumption of high quantities of alcohol or cocaine. And in the case of uh, low levels, it makes you more vulnerable. And since then, multiple studies in other laboratories have actually corroborated this finding, that if you enhance signaling through these D2 receptors, it is a protective factor against the consumption or the emergence of compulsive behaviors. We have wanted to ask why. Why is it increasing your protection, having high levels of D2 receptors? Or alternatively, why does it make you more vulnerable having low levels? 
So what we've done, our strategy has been, on the one hand, in the same individual, measure the dopamine D2 receptor levels in the brain, whether they are cocaine abusers, methamphetamine abusers, or alcoholics. But at the same time, measure in their brain brain, brain glucose metabolism. And why measure brain glucose metabolism? Um, it makes sense we decided to use glucose metabolism because your brain uses glucose as its main energy source. And when an area of the brain is not functioning properly, you can actually detect that very early on because there is a reduction in the consumption of glucose. So this imaging technique of measuring glucose metabolism, for example, can be used clinically to identify when someone is at high risk of Alzheimer's disease or Huntington, Korea, even before the symptoms appear, because you can document the decreases in activity in specific areas of the brain. So we use the same strategy and but in, to determine whether there were changes in brain glucose metabolism in addicted people, which they are, but more importantly, to determine if the changes, these reductions in D2 receptors were associated with specific changes in activity in the brain. And what we found, which again, when we first found it was very surprising, was that the main association between low levels of dopamine D2 receptors was with reduced activity in prefrontal areas of the brain, which as I have mentioned to you before, are fundamental in our ability to make a decision, make a judgment, determine if uh, the, the event makes sense, and carry it through, through the connections uh, downstream. And what we showed was the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the activity of prefrontal areas whether you are a cocaine abuser, whether you are a methamphetamine abuser, whether you are an alcoholic, the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors in these three areas regions, the lower the activity of these prefrontal cortical regions of the brain. And you have it, you have it here. Now we can map why that, and that is another example of, of why these uh, D2 receptors, how they are involved. D2 receptors, these are not people that are addicted, these are individuals at high risk of alcoholism because they come from a family, a history of alcoholism, uh, but they are not alcoholic. And you see exactly the same phenomena that in, in portraying here are the regions now show differently in different planes of the brain from the upper parts to the lower parts where l l the levels of dopamine D2 receptors are associated with metabolic activity. And you see that it is uh, D2 receptors and metabolism are associated predominantly in prefrontal areas of the brain. This is the, the orbital frontal cortex, very ventral part of the frontal cortex, but also in dorsolateral prefrontal regions. And this is exactly the reason why probably having low levels of dopamine D2 receptors, as has been shown consistently by many investigators, including our laboratory, is associated with greater vulnerability because it's actually disrupting the activity of prefrontal areas of the brain that are necessary in order to exert self-control. And as I mentioned, we now know that circuitry, dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum, modulate the frontal cortex. And when you have low levels of D2 receptor in the striatum, we now know all of the connections, that results in decreased excitation of the frontal cortex. And as a result of that, that explains that decreased activity throughout the whole frontal cortex that has been reported in cocaine abusers as well as methamphetamine abusers or alcoholics, uh, which also has led us to identify as one of the fundamental problems in addiction, the improper function of areas of the brain that are necessary to exert self-control. So how do we now conceptualize the process of addiction? We know that to start with, addiction is not a disease where you have an enhanced response to the drug itself. You have an enhanced response to the memory that predicts that you have learned that will activate the system when you are in an environment where you've taken the drug or you encounter someone with whom you've taken the drug or when there is, you are stressed those factors will activate the, um, the drive circuitry 
but the drug itself will be very attenuated. And this attenuation of the response of the reward system to the drug generalizes to all of the natural rewards, which, by the way, are much less potent than drugs. So this further um, puts the individual at risk because normal stimuli that are rewarding that motivate our behavior actually are no longer able to activate the motivational circuitry. And that makes you lose the alternative behaviors. We now know also that in addition to that disruption of the reward circuitry, there is a significant disruption of the whole prefrontal cortical region circuitry that's necessary for control. So this is a simplified model that actually we've brought up, uh, simplified to try to, to help us identify how this knowledge can help us understand the process of addiction. So this is a non-addicted brain. All of us, on a daily basis, several times a day, are exposed to stimuli that, that actually makes us want them, we want them, and we want to consume them or do them. But at the same time, we cognitively say, maybe it's not a good idea for me to do it. And even sometimes it's not just like the classical, do I want to eat this chocolate or not? But even we're driving in a car and we see that yellow light and we have to make the decision, am I going to accelerate to try to get the light or am I going to stop? And that decision requires our prefrontal cortex. Of course, it's desirable to go fast because then we are going to gain time and that's rewarding. But cognitively, we say it's not a good idea. So constantly, we are employing this uh, decision making of, yes, it would be ideal if I get there earlier, but on the other hand, no, I could end up on an accident. Or yes, I should eat this chocolate, but no, I'm going to gain weight. And, and a balance between multiple circuit networks in our brain is going to determine the outcome. So I want to eat that chocolate, but I am love chocolate, but I don't want to gain weight. So but I'm salivating and I, I'm very, very hungry and I want it and I want it, but my prefrontal cortex is early in the morning and I'm actually not frustrated, not stressed, not tired. I said, okay, I'm not eating it. And I'm able to stop and resist it. Now, I'm going to confess that if you tell me six o'clock in the afternoon or seven o'clock at night when I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I didn't get my grant, blah, 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 I got into a fight, this and that, and my ability to exert control is going to be depleted. So the same chocolate, the same chocolate exactly, may, I may not be able to resist it. And I bring this up because these systems are dynamic and our ability to exert control is influenced by environmental stimuli. Stress erodes it, the entire erodes it, and, and that's why we are all better able to self, exert self-control sometimes than others. And sometimes it's okay, right, to let go and say, I'm going to do it. The problem becomes when it's basically it's consistently impossible to exert control. And that's exactly what addiction is like. The same system, but the function is disrupted in a very profound way. Memory systems, and I didn't go into them, are actually engaged in addiction. I told you that there was this structural changes that occur that strengthen the connectivity, and that's the memory, the conditioning, that strengthening, and that drives the saliency system. And that's exactly one of the things why addiction is so difficult to treat, because even though the, the, the actually you don't have the drug, you're surrounded by cues that remind you of the drug, and that surrounded of the cues that remind you of the drug will then activate your motivation to go and seek it. That's part of the problem. On top of that, you have the prefrontal cortex that is, its function is deranged by the fact that this dopamine D2 receptor system that regulates it is actually dysfunctional as a function of the consumption of drugs. So this system that normally acts like your brakes, that says, no, it's not a good idea, and it's going to self-regulate you, is not functioning properly. So you have, on the one hand, this is weakened, and on this is strengthened. So this is strengthened versus vis-a-vis -vis normal. So that drives, and you cannot actually stop it. The, the control system is not working, and that explains why when someone is exposed to a cue or a tiny concentration of the drug, the prefrontal cortex gets disconnected. It gets disconnected. It 
becomes like almost like an automatic reflex action that cannot be terminated. And the person takes the drug, and even though the drug effect by itself is attenuated, as you show, it produces the craving, and that creates a positive feedback loop that cannot be terminated because the prefrontal cortex is no longer able to do it. So the question is, in understanding this model and knowing that multiple circuits are disrupted by the consumption of drugs, how do we learn from me to try to help the person that's addicted? And the first thing that I would say is that it, it highlights the importance of multi-pronged approaches to actually strengthen the prefrontal cortex so that you can control better, to provide alternative reward such that it's not just the drug that motivates the actions of the individual, and to engage um, interventions that lead the that person that's addicted to have knowledge, to have self-knowledge about what are the stimuli or the conditions that in their experience triggers the craving, the desire to avoid them, to teach them how to avoid them so that they minimize the situation where an exposure to a friend with which they've taken the drugs or a stress situation uh, or an environment, a neighborhood where they take the drugs. Uh, to avoid them so that they don't go into this conditioning that is very, very difficult to stop. And again, like anything else in medicine, uh, you don't need to just focus on one strategy, but actually uh, multiple strategies that can strengthen executive function, that can provide alternative reward, and that can actually also help the individual to lessen the memories that trigger those condition responses. In many instances, those condition responses are linked to emotions. So the recognition that depression, boredom, frustration are many times the symptoms that result in the craving is another very important target in addiction. And with that, I want to just thank, uh, and last slide, my, my uh, colleagues at Brookhaven National Laboratory fundamental in many of these studies, and I want to thank you for your attention, and now I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Nora, for an, an extraordinary presentation, and, and just as importantly for the work and dedication that you've done uh, for this very important subject, uh, which can have a tremendous impact on so many lives. One question that a number of people are asking about relates to um, dual diagnosis, people who may experience chemical dependency along with an additional psychiatric diagnosis. And I'd like to ask you to say a little bit about that. Yeah, no, and that is a very important question because, in fact, when I was discussing that not everybody becomes addicted and there are on some individuals that are more vulnerable than others, among the vulnerable populations are individuals that have a mental illness. And all of, all, most of the mental diseases are associated with a higher comorbidity of a substance use disorders. Not all of them, but most of them. And one of the factors why, and there, there may, I mean, obviously researchers have tried to look into it and try to understand what are the dynamics. And the dynamics um, identify comorbidity that goes in both directions. That is to say, you, have, you can have a teenager in whom there is a mental illness uh, starting to emerge that they don't recognize. So they may have depression. They don't know that they have the clinical uh, diagnosis of a depression. They just don't feel right. Or they may have ADHD, and nobody knows that they have ADHD. And just they are trying to feel better. They are trying to function better. And by pure chance, because as an adolescent, the likelihood that you get exposed to drugs is very high, they get exposed to drugs and then they feel better. And without them actually even being conscious of the fact that these drugs are making them feel better, they get conditioned to it that way. And that makes them at greater risk, of course, to try it again, and therefore much greater risk to transition into addiction. But the other, the other comorbidity also happens. Someone, as they take drugs, I actually emphasize that one of the points is you start to get a decreased reactivity of the dopamine system, 
And the dopamine system is fundamental in our ability to perceive rewards and pleasure. And that in and of itself is one of the symptoms of, of, of depression, anhedonia. So as you, and, 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 and in parallel to these changes that I described, studies have also shown that in the addicted person, there's an enhanced sensitivity of stress networks that include among them the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So as a person that you're addicted, you're much more prone to dysphoria and stress reactions when you get exposed to a frustrating stimuli. And that, of course, makes you more vulnerable to an anxiety disorder. It makes you vulnerable to depression. So if you have a vulnerability for the depressive uh, depression from other factors and you are taking drugs chronically, that is likely to contribute to the triggering of the event or the severity of the event. And also the comorbidities of alcohol or drugs, including nicotine, let's not forget that nicotine is a, an addictive substance with many of the mental illnesses is going to influence the outcomes. And what's interesting is it can influence them in either potentially positive effects or there are temporarily that can then result in negative actions. Like nicotine, for example, has been shown to improve the ability to sustain attention in ADHD. We also know that nicotine has antidepressant properties. The problem is that as an antidepressant, it does not work very well, particularly if you consider the fact that uh, you are going to be interrupting it if you want because of its negative medical effects. That can in turn be associated with a relapse, so it can exacerbate the depressive symptom. Similarly, with nicotine and ADHD, when people smoke cigarettes, when they are not under the effects of nicotine, during that early stages of withdrawal, their uh, attention is worse than when they were not taking nicotine. So this is the problem of drugs, that the pharmacokinetics create a temporary alleviation that with repeated exposures just make it worse. And very important, and I just want to mention it because I think it is very relevant right now, is marijuana. And there's been a lot of interest in terms of the potential connection between marijuana and psychosis. And yes, high content, uh, marijuana high content, 9-THD, active ingredient, will produce a psychosis. Basically, almost, if you give a high enough dose almost in anybody. Most of those psychoses are acute psychosis and will recover. But in a subgroup of individuals, and we believe those are the individuals that have vulnerability, perhaps, because of genetic uh, reasons, it can trigger a schizophrenic, a chronic psychosis that has then led on to a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Those chronic psychoses are the ones that are most worrisome, and there is evidence that if you do have the genetic vulnerability, the use of marijuana can trigger the psychosis earlier and can be more severe. And the other issue, too, is that some investigators even may have postulated that it may trigger them in individuals that had they not smoked marijuana, that schizophrenia would have not emerged, even though they had that genetic vulnerability. It's a very important issue because right now with all of the changes in policy with marijuana, uh, one of the concerns is uh, that individuals with mental illness, which are among the most vulnerable to the consumption of drugs, may be more vulnerable as these laws get passed to uh, getting exposed to marijuana. I think that's a very important point and one that uh, people often ask about. Um, and I think you stated very clearly uh, why this is so crucial and puts so many people at risk. And um, one of the areas we look for is prevention and avoiding marijuana is a way to um, put in place uh, prevention for those who are at risk. So I think it's a very important point. I, I want to ask you about the the issue of suicide and suicide prevention um, in people who have um, addiction, um, yeah. and just see where the research is with that and what people should be aware of with regard to that important issue. 
Yeah, and that is, uh, I would say, an extremely important aspect of addiction. Individuals that are addicted are at a significantly higher risk of suicide. And, and this is, in, in a way, a reflection of this enhanced negative, uh, the enhanced sensitivity of the negative mood circuitry and the stress reactivity that emerges with repeated use of drugs. And it's interestingly something that is not uh, recognized by many, but it uh, actually can, if not recognized early on or properly addressed, can of course lead to very severe outcomes. In among the addictions, the one where this is much more likely to emerge is with heroin addiction or with addiction to opiates. Because the person that is addicted to these drugs has in their hand uh, drugs that are very dangerous because of uh, the respiratory depressing effects. So this can push the limits in terms of actually someone that may have a problem. Mm -hmm. I have, are you all there, guys? Yes, I hear you now. It, it, it was a blank for a, for a second or two. So I think that in general it's an issue that clinicians and family members should be alerted about the potential of uh, of a suicidality, and this has even been recognized in, uh, for the case of marijuana, that it increases the risk of suicidal thinking. And interestingly, which brings up the notion on the one hand that, that drugs increase depression and dysphoria, but the other aspect why drugs can increase suicidality is because they increase impulsivity. So not only are they increasing suicidality as it relates to the fact that you are more likely to be depressed and hopeless and helpless, but also because the drugs by their actions enhance your impulsivity. So these two phenomena going together do not work at all. And the third on top, if you are dealing with drugs themselves are, that are, are toxic, uh, such as I say, particularly problematic with things like, like heroin or opiates, oxycontin, fentanyl, people addicted to these opiates um, are very, if they increase their doses, are at very high risk of overdosing and dying. Um, very important points. In our last remaining moments, what advice do you give to a family member whose loved one is abusing drugs? How do you get them to, to accept help? Well, the first thing that I would tell to them is that uh, they have to recognize um, that, that the person, their family member or friend, has a disease of the brain. That it is, in that respect, not different from epilepsy or schizophrenia. It's a disease for which they have no choice. They may have initially, when they were younger, had the choice of taking drugs, but they didn't choose to get addicted. And at the essence of addiction is that it disrupts the areas of the brain that enable you to self-regulate. And that is what you need in order to, to once well, you make a decision and says, I'm not going to do it anymore. Those areas of the brain that allow you to carry through with your goal are disrupted by addiction. And that's why it, it's so very difficult for people that are not addicted to understand why a person cannot just stop taking the drug. Because they don't understand that the system, the, the network, the circuitry that's necessary for them to be able to stop is not functioning. So that's one of the things, recognizing that the addiction is a disease. But the second very important one is it can be treated. But again, recognizing that the treatment intervention is not going to be a miracle that just by going one month to a treatment or three months, that's going to be sufficient. It is a chronic disease. And the changes in the brain produced by drugs are long lasting, sometimes years after the person has stopped taking the drug. And therefore, the treatment intervention has to have a plan for continuity of care. And within that message of addiction as a chronic disease, the possibility of relapse is actually very likely. But like with any other chronic disease, a relapse should not be seen as giving up. 
but actually an indication of restarting the treatment. Just like what you would do with cancer. If someone relapses on a cancer, you don't give up on the person. You restart the treatment. And, and this is the same a model that should be used in the person that's addicted. My third message, which is, again, uh, relates to what is a family or a friend, social networks are fundamental components on the recovery aspect of the person that's addicted that social networks are an alternative reinforcer that can provide the individual a structure to help them combat this disease, fight against the disease. So withdrawing that support from the individual would actually not only interfere with the recovery, but it could actually accelerate the relapse because of that lack of network structure is extraordinarily stressful and therefore could trigger one of uh, the factors that you know is involved in the relapsing on the, of the individuals that are addicted, stressors, stressful environment. The lack of a social support system is a stressful environment. So that's a message to family and friends that as frustrating as it may seem, it is important to sustain that social support for the person that is addicted, to not give up. A very important message not to give up because um, there are many, many people who are in recovery and able to do well. And I think that to, to maintain that hope is crucial. And I want to again say thank you so much. Um, your work um, brings hope to people, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. All of the research that we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, visit the webinar page at our website. I hope that you'll join us again next month when Dr. Fritz Henn, Foundation Scientific Council member and 2014 Colvin Prize winner for Outstanding Achievement in Mood Disorders Research, um, professor of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, will present new approaches in treating depression. This will take place on Tuesday, September 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you, Dr. Volkow. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I want to wish everybody um, a pleasant rest of the day. Take care. Jeff, thanks. Jeff, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.